how the conception of computers catapulted chaos theory into our collective com- Fuck! So close! Hello friends, the Arcadia series has finished. Although there is still more science in this book, I really don't know enough about any of it, so you're gonna have to miss out on the concept of statistical noise with Valentine's Grouse, or how the conception of computers catapulted chaos theory into our collective consciousness, or the funniest line in the play when Bernard is ranting about scientists to Valentine. Oh, I find I'll let you have that. I pushed a lot of you over a cliff myself! Except the one in the wheelchair, I think I'd lose the sympathy vote before people had time to think it through. Let that be Arcadia's last word on science, and let us move on to bigger and better things. For one thing, some months after starting my mathematics and philosophy course, I've only just started to learn about the philosophy of mathematics. I want to try and give you a very potted version of what I've been doing in the first few weeks of my course, which is on a man called Gottlob Frege. Gottlob Frege did most of his work at the turn of the 20th century, which was a very interesting period for mathematics. Basically, mathematics in Europe started with the Greeks, who proved everything they stated very rigorously from first principles. These are the geometric proofs you know and love today about right-angled triangles and subtended circle arcs and all that jazz. Then, around the time of Newton, mathematics started to get a bit weird. Newton's calculus conjured up infinitesimals which tended to zero and created beautiful results, but no one really minded or actually checked fully that if some of Newton's infinitesimals tended to zero, that meant that you couldn't divide by them, ever, because you can't divide by zero. The weird thing was that Newton's calculus seemed to work. It was used by engineers everywhere without ever failing. Isambard Kingdom Brunel's beautiful and sometimes very precarious looking stove pipe hat didn't collapse in and on itself, so no one saw the problem that we didn't actually know if any of this stuff was true. But during the 19th century, mathematics became more and more obsessed with precision and elimination of the careless mistakes of the old guard. New and watertight definitions were made using something called epsilon delta notation for fuzzy concepts in calculus like integration and differentiation, and concepts which were obvious to think about but had never been mathematically defined started to be thought out properly. For example, take continuity of a graph. Now, as soon as I tell you what continuity of a graph is, you'll get it immediately. It's really simple. A continuous graph is a graph that can be drawn as one long line without jumping anywhere. It's, that's it. This is continuous, this isn't continuous, this is continuous, and this isn't continuous. The thing is, when you're proving stuff about continuous graphs, definitions need to be more than just a prompt for you understanding what the thing is. They need to tell you absolutely everything about the property it's describing. So, without further ado, let me give you the mathematical definition of a continuous graph. A continuous graph is a graph which is continuous and all of the points on the graph. That was easy, wasn't it? It's a bit trickier to define how a graph is continuous at a point. It's done by the aforementioned epsilon delta notation, which basically says that for any number that you can pick, I can pick another number so that our two numbers together make some kind of little mathematical magic trick work. So for continuity of a point on a graph, if you picked out a bar on the graph with the point in it of any non-zero width at all, then I can pick out a column on the graph so that every bit of the graph that is in my column is also in your row. Now if you take the official BOFNET 17 million year period to think about that, I'm making that official BOFNET canon by the way, then you can sort of understand that that means that at that point the graph doesn't jump anywhere unexpected, and a continuous graph is therefore a graph where every point doesn't jump anywhere unexpected. Now all you need to do is translate that into mathematical notation by defining epsilon, delta, p, f, p and x. It comes out as this disturbing looking piece of mathematical language. Let's take that away now, I don't want to mistakenly revise my summer exams. That'd be uh, stupid. Once you've defined this, you can prove other things from the definition of continuity with absolute mathematical certainty which is a step forward from Newton's slightly flawed proofs based on slightly flawed definitions. This was the world into which Frege came, a world that was just starting to recognise the benefits of obsessively and precisely defining obvious things using transparent mathematical language. But Frege wanted to go further. He wanted to define, in the same precise way, the natural number line. He wanted to define the operations of arithmetic, of addition and subtraction, and he wanted to show that logically there was no possible other way that they could ever be defined. No one had ever tried this definition from pure logic before. In fact, pure logic had only just been invented in 1879 by Gottlob Frege, so he was the ideal man for the job. Internet, I've probably overrun. Go outside and enjoy the glorious weather. I will see you when I see you. Johnny, your short bio of T.S. Eliot was wonderful. I suppose people can say what they like about Sajid Javid, the former shining light to George Osborne's treasury recently promoted to culture secretary, but they've got to admit that bankers can occasionally write poetry quite well. 
Eliot's metaphor about poets being catalysts for the poetic process also reminded me of something that the 20th century mathematician Paul Erdos once said. A mathematician is a machine for turning coffee into theorems. He was Hungarian. I am good at accents. Just finished recording this one. Thought you might want to see. Smart at the top, charged at the bottom. By the way, another thing I forgot is that I'd like to give a shout out uh, to my tutors who were told about this channel. It's always nice to know that your video on Cantor and Infinity is being judged by someone who is a world expert on Infinity. So, yeah, you know, essentially, Adrian, what I'm saying is please don't tell anyone about the mistakes I'm making. I will see you when I see you. A little bit like a Nazi salute there. Probably gonna do that one again, especially since I'm wearing a black shirt now as a uniform. That's really not an idea of an image that I want on the internet in 30 years time, when I'm applying for the job as president of the world. Uh.